your entire identity, mind-made me, false self, ego, is a cyclical hell because it's founded upon an unsubstantiated claim that you're not whole and that this must be corrected through seeking. Just ask, does it make sense to leave freedom in order to find it? The world cannot provide you with truth. It can only reflect it. How long do you have to seek before you can see the entirety of yourself in a mirror? The reason your identity is founded upon the belief that you're not whole is because you experienced a critical moment of unbearable pain during the first few years of life where you decided unequivocally that something was incomplete and therefore wrong with you. While you may have experienced several painful and traumatic moments during childhood, only one moment in particular decided the fate of your entire unconscious life path. This is why stopping the search for wholeness can be so incredibly terrifying. You'll inevitably be forced to make contact with this fundamental pain that's been keeping you going all of these years. To your mind, encountering this pain is the equivalent of coming face to face with death. If you want to encounter this pain with as little fear as possible, then you'll have to become honest about your underlying motivations in life and whether or not those motivations have been serving you. Do you believe that acquiring something, attaining something, becoming something, or experiencing something will ultimately bring you lasting fulfillment? What's been your experience up until now? Has any positive experience that you've had ever sustained itself indefinitely? Do you know what it means to be at peace? If you're ready, then what I'm saying will sound a lot less like a recipe for misery and self-torture and more like an invitation to become free of the chains that have kept you in survival mode for the majority of your life. If you're not ready, then what I'm saying will sound like too much of a risk. It will feel like there's too much to lose and not enough to be gained. Most human beings are not ready to be free and would prefer to build greater meaning around their struggles so that they can justify avoiding their pain. For the false self, it's safer to find meaning in struggle than it is to have no meaning and not struggle. To not struggle anymore would mean that you've accepted defeat on some level because your life would still feel incomplete. Of course, the actual experience of no struggle is something different altogether. It's peace, it's contentment. It's pretty much everything that you thought you had to search for first. Most of your early beliefs are handed to you by your parents, relatives, and friends. You have to be willing to question your most trusted advisors if you're to have any chance of becoming free of the unnecessary belief systems that are holding you back, keeping you asleep. In reality, no belief system is your friend. As the philosopher Nietzsche once said, belief means not wanting to know what is true. The fact is, whenever there is belief, there is avoidance. Belief is the booby prize that steals the show from the ecstatic, orgasmic truth that is life in its raw, unconditioned state. Your beliefs will take time to dissolve as you continue questioning what moves you. One of the reasons letting go of beliefs can be so challenging is because of the Santa Claus effect, which is the tendency to defend beliefs in order to avoid encountering deep emotional wounds. One Christmas, while waiting with my son at the customer service desk in Costco, a woman asked my son if he was looking forward to Santa coming. 
In a matter of fact tone, my son replied, Santa's not real. The woman replied almost forcefully, saying, Yes, he is. You better be a good boy or you won't get anything for Christmas. Aside from the noticeable anger in her voice, it was clear that she was defending a sacred belief. As we turned and walked away, I realized that her response was also her way of avoiding an emotional wound that she had suffered long ago. Like millions of other children around the world, she undoubtedly had been given the belief when she was very young that Santa Claus was a real person and that he really does fly around the world in one night giving gifts to well-behaved children. She also likely suffered an emotional wound when after several years of believing in this man was told that he wasn't real or even worse, found out on her own. The pain that was caused by realizing that she had been lied to by her parents and everyone else whom she thought she could trust must have been too much for her to process all at once. Instead, the experience likely created a split in her mind where one part of her accepted the truth while the other part refused to believe it. Given that this woman was in her 50s, the pain she experienced must have been very great at the time. Your belief-based reality consists of little beliefs and big beliefs. Little beliefs are statements that you tell yourself which reflect the running storyline of your life, like, I'm a lawyer, or I'm a good person, or I'm ugly, or I'm beautiful. Big beliefs are statements that you tell yourself which reflect the fundamental mechanics of duality like me or you or us or them. Letting go of your little beliefs can happen quickly once you recognize that they're nothing more than superficial labels that have been adopted out of trauma and pain. Letting go of your fundamental big beliefs, however, is where the real work takes place. Most of the time, you're not even aware that you're operating under their spell. Big beliefs are rooted more deeply than any other belief because they've arisen from identification with the body. The body's five senses form the foundation of the false self by encouraging the mind to claim ownership over whatever is perceived and experienced. Sound, sight, taste, touch, and smell are natural functions of the body that make it very easy for you to over-identify with it. The body is a vehicle for your awareness and responds to your commands, but it doesn't require you to identify with it in order for it to be able to function in the world. In other words, you don't have to claim the body as mine in order for it to be able to do everything it already does for you. Have you noticed? You don't make your body breathe, and yet it breathes. You don't make your body hear, and yet it hears. You don't make your body see, and yet it sees. You don't make your body taste and smell, and yet it tastes and smells. In fact, you don't make your body do anything. It does it all for you. Witnessing life as it unfolds moment to moment is how you disidentify from the body. Ironically, a useful tool for helping you develop this habit is the five senses. Whatever you go into fully and consciously, you go beyond. By acutely focusing on each of the five senses, a doorway will open that will enable you to see what lies beyond them. Find out for yourself. Take a moment and sit still as you do nothing but rest your gaze on an object in the room. At first, you'll notice that it will feel like you're looking at something. Once you notice that you're telling yourself that you're looking at something, let go of that label. Give yourself a minute to let this deeply ingrained label fall away. 
When you're no longer telling yourself that you're looking at something, a deeper dimension will start to reveal itself. As you sit and hold your gaze on that object without telling yourself that that's what you're doing, the object will start to emanate a silent, intelligent presence. In reality, it will not start to do this. It was always doing this. You're just emptying yourself out enough to actually notice its deeper reality for the first time. Your identification with being the one who sees will start to dissolve the more you practice this. This is how you go beyond your identification with the body. By going deeply and totally into the five senses and relinquishing ownership over them, you disidentify from them. When you go beyond the senses, you return to your original self, which is the witness. The witness is not bound by identification. Strictly speaking, awareness that is not identified with anything has no self. This need not be difficult to understand. Simply acknowledge that in order for you to be, you must first think about something. All thinking is identification. When you're not thinking, you're not. Most of your world is upheld by your thinking, which is why you can't stop doing it. To the false self, not thinking is to die. To your true self, not thinking is to be born again. It's important not to underestimate the profundity of what happens when you're not thinking. I'm not talking about giving up on your ability to use your intelligence or your ability to make decisions. I'm talking about what happens when you step out of the constant stream of unnecessary mind chatter. To stop this sort of thinking is no big deal if you just do it for a few minutes and then start doing it again. Stopping this thinking consistently, however, is a recipe for transformation. When you step out of this chatter consistently, you're removing yourself from the illusory world of your false self. When you remove yourself from this illusion long enough, the false world that you've created around you starts to become much more apparent, as well as the reasons for why you created it. Ultimately, every reason for why you've been drawn to create and sustain a false self comes back to one core reason. You don't want to be alone. True aloneness, however, is oneness with all of life. You don't have to believe in oneness for it to be true. It's already the case. You do, however, have to believe that you're separate from life. To think that you're somebody requires you to believe in that thought, to put energy towards that idea. To rest as the nobody that you are requires nothing of you. There's no effort needed to be who you really are. This is partly why the enlightened state is an enjoyable one, because you realize that your true self is on permanent vacation. Only your false self is permanently employed. What's true right now is what you're experiencing. And what is that? Notice that the story of how you got here and where you think you're going doesn't match up with the reality of what's happening right now. Notice that the equivalent of past, present, future is actually mortal human, uncreated immortal consciousness, mortal human. Step outside of this eternal instant, even for just a second, and you've just taken cosmic consciousness and turned it into a mortal human being who's on a narrow-minded, superficial life journey with an illusory sense of purpose and importance. Step back inside of this instant 
and you've obliterated all journeys. You've arrived home and you're able to recognize that you are the thing you've always been seeking. When your attention is resting on itself, the present, there's no more room for psychological divisions or labels. Your presence is revealed to be the same presence as the rest of the universe. What is present together is not really together at all, but simply oneness that's not divided anymore by a segmenting mind. Stay present long enough and you'll realize that you and what some people call source are one and the same. You are simply a microcosm of the macrocosm. <laughs>